Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with David Blinder, Associate Vice Chancellor at the University of California, Berkeley. David Blinder leads diverse areas of UC Berkeley's development enterprise, including corporate and foundation relations, individual giving, international giving, and communication functions. He previously was the Vice President for Resource and Public Affairs at Wellesley College, where he managed one of the largest liberal arts college fundraising campaigns at that time. David has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, David, for taking the time to join us today. You. You've had quite a journey uh, to UC Berkeley. Uh, so let's chat a little bit about the university, the scope of the organization that you manage, and the range of programs and activities that you fund. And then perhaps we can go back and talk a little bit about how you wound up in this, th this position of, uh, of driving fundraising. Sure, sure. Yeah, it has been uh, a journey. <laughs> Uh, UC Berkeley is a very big university, and uh, it is as complicated as it is big. We are, as university relations, the central development for the campus, which is covering 400, more than 420,000 living alumni. 420,000 living alumni. Worldwide, mm -hmm. worldwide. Um, in the database, well over a million names and contact information and so on. So and histories that, and, and all that. Exactly, with, with, with all of that. So we are the repository of all of that information, uh, which we then need to be able to disseminate back out to the campuses as needed with appropriate confidentiality and so on. Uh, we have within that university relations central organization, at this point, about 180 FTEs. Uh, many of those folks involved in gift processing, fund administration, uh, a small number proportionally in what we would think of you and I as frontline fundraising. These are the people who report directly in to your organization. That's right. It's 180 uh, full-time equivalent individuals, and then, of course, attached to those are, are, is, is an army of volunteers. That's right. That's right. Um, that organization not only is uh, raising funds in its own right, but it's also serving the ra a range of other uh, fundraising units that report in to Scott Biddy. They actually report into the deans and the directors of those academic units and actually without even a dotted line relationship. So from a purely political uh, viewpoint and a communications viewpoint, how does one negotiate this very uh, complex terrain where you have deans with intersecting constituencies, um, you certainly have the undergraduate and the graduate schools uh, intersecting, uh, they have intersecting constituencies and alumni, um, how, does, how does that actually work, in particular where there is no dotted line reporting relationship? This function of using our influence, and I'd like to think our expertise, to influence uh, how things unfold within the fundraising operations of, those other, of all the units is probably the primary function. I am in, in, in an ideal world with the Vice Chancellor, I report to Scott Biddy, uh, pretty much in constant conversation with the deans, uh, and certainly with the chancellor and the provost, the chief academic officer, uh, on fundraising matters. Well, the place where we have, uh, I'd say, even more than influence is we are working directly for the chancellor. The chancellor is far and away the most important fundraiser for the campus, and he is not only, in effect, dealing with, personally dealing with that prospect, that very special uh, prospect pool, but also meeting with us on a regular basis as needed, we'll bring deans into those meetings, but those are meetings where we really do map out strategy. We're always consulting with the units so that they feed into that process, but that's a, an efficient, pretty efficient way of making sure that with the top rated prospects and donors, uh, there's a kind of coherent, uh, consistent strategy from the campus. The affiliation with a school or a college or the athletic program becomes a prime mover and then it's perfectly natural for a dean or a faculty member to take a lead or a coach for that matter to take a lead uh, in that work. Now when you came in you didn't come in from the UC system you didn't even come from California so you come into this environment which is extraordinarily complex where relationships matter how was that to, to come in from from Wellesley. Mm -hmm. 
Well, so the continuity that's very important is, in, in my view, this is a personal view about fundraising and how development works best, it is relational. It's not transactional. Part of what we're doing really is, is not quite beginning, but really supporting, nourishing a process that's pretty new in relationship building. Now, in that respect, the job that I was doing at Wellesley or Princeton isn't so different from Berkeley. Right. It's not so different, as you know, whatever nonprofit you're, you're involved in, if they do it well. The complexity of the strategies, how one uh, can, in effect, persuade and cajole one's colleagues, whether they're on the academic side or in the fundraising side, about the strategy that we think is really going to produce. And my criterion is always, what will the donor be most satisfied with and what will be best for the university? It's always the fit between those two. My job, I feel, is to underscore the return and the fit with the university and the university's priorities. That's where the, the dance happens. It seems that in order to navigate all this complexity, mm -hmm. there is a huge investment of time, and that time can become interminable. How do you deal with mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a, it's a very big challenge, and um, there's no, simple, there's no simple answer and there's no simple solution. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. When we're doing capital projects on the campus, these are decisions that are initially made through a very elaborate planning process nice. on the Berkeley campus, but all of the buildings that are part of the University of California system are governed and in effect owned by the UC Board of Regents. Okay, so this is a state property. So all of a sudden, all of that planning is now multiplied, the kind of matrix of decision making, mm -hmm. uh, with the Office of the President and the University uh, of California Regents uh, as well, and all of the people who were involved in it, whether it's But if you're doing a capital project, there is a certain date of a, of a groundbreaking, and um, I'm sure that's part of the plan, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, 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 I guess you have an even, an even bigger time ex issue. Exactly, and you build in, uh, must build in uh, a lot of flexibility into that timeline. Very different from the private universities, certainly the universities that I've been associated with, where there is an endowment that is a financial cushion. Flip over to the other side, we're doing world-class, cutting-edge research right. in virtually every area of the campus. That doesn't wait for a timeline. It's our job to know uh, who's out there who supports work in biofuels, who supports work in sustainable design and so on in order to move and, and what are their situations because again a principle that we need to follow and, and we're constantly trying to push out to the campus units is uh, we really want to make sure that the donors feel good about their gift. Is this part of, of the cultural shift that, that you are bringing in, or you're helping yeah. to bring in, right. from the uh, privately funded uh, mm -hmm. institutions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it happens in a couple of different ways, and, and cultural shift is really, I think, what we are about. I think one, one way is to, you know, in my own mind, the cultural shift had to do with working for private, uh, let us say, the elite private institutions, like Wellesley and Princeton, the ethos there is so strongly around private giving because that's been the lifeblood of these organizations. Come into the public university system in the University of California, which had been historically so generously supported by, by the legislature, and now we're looking at the last 25 years and it's a trajectory that just keeps going dramatically downward. There's a communication gap that's happened with our constituencies. And uh, I don't want to say half the time, but certainly a substantial amount of my time and my colleagues' time is spent informing the constituency about how the state has had to pull back mm -hmm. its support. And the only way we're going to keep Berkeley at that top level of excellence is private philanthropy private. and proper private. investment of endowment gifts and so on. So that, that is really a crucial part of the cultural change. Uh, with our outside constituency. And the inside constituency, I think the cultural change there, which had been well underway in terms of a consciousness about the importance of development, the importance of fundraising, that's there in all of the schools, is what you were describing earlier, some sensitivity to the 
donor's timetable rather than me coming in as a dean and telling you, here are the 12 things that I lose my sleep over. Help me as fast as you can. And in this environment especially, that, that becomes a challenge. And it's reasonable for these deans to be out there looking at what can I get in the door now, mm -hmm. even if there's some trade-off, if you look at from a more, say, neutral perspective. Um, have you encountered situations where um, uh, deans are, are locked in, th in an intractable situation in which, um, through no fault of anybody's, um, th there just needs to be some adjudication uh, going on? How does that actually get resolved? The wonderful part about a place like Berkeley is there really is a, a, a shared uh, feeling for the mission of the place, the goals that are being set. So you, you really have that as a kind of fundamental principle. So one of the first steps in, the, in that process where there are two or three uh, schools or colleges who are in a, in a sense locked in a particular strategy that's, that's going to be at a, in conflict is to really just sit down, get the people who are party to these decisions at the table together because so they're they all operating. Talk to each other. Yeah, talk to each other. And often that's all that's needed. And that's a role, Scott, or I can play. Um, where it gets trickier is when you start getting in times like this where the prospect population at the very top of the prospect pool starts to the same people are appearing on the same, lists, on the right, list, right? right? The business school and the engineering school and the right. athletics right. program. Uh, and it's, as you say, no fault of anybody. These are people who have multiple interests and right. therefore, if they're $10 million prospects, they should be $10 million for my school. Right. So then, at that point, there's a, the Court of Appeals really brings <laughs> us up to the provost and, in the end, to the chancellor. Uh, there, suddenly, there is authority and accountability <laughs> yes. at that level. And, and again, the interest of the, of the leadership on the campus, and I really mean this across the board, is to have a harmonious and successful campus. So the culture of the institution is an important element as to what works and what doesn't work. Absolutely. What this whole process uh, you're implying uh, might not work in an organization that had a different culture, that perhaps had a, had a much more aggressive culture mm -hmm. and, a, and mm -hmm. a less considerate a, uh, culture. Yes, I um, think that's true. Uh, of each other. Yeah, and you find that so personalities, leadership, the personalities will matter. They matter. Uh, and, and often, you know, makes it very challenging for us is uh, somebody who's really quite attuned to fundraising in, the, in an academic leadership role, uh, very forceful personality. Yes. There makes them a good fundraiser, they're connecting with their constituency, but they're also moving their agenda uh, hard and fast. Right. And right. the more gracious colleagues are sitting and saying, wait a second, yeah. what about me here, you know? Tensions can rise. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, but, uh, but I, w I do think culture matters uh, enormously. And uh, uh, the way in which the CEO, so it's the chancellor or in the private uh, arena, the president uh, can handle those issues is really key. Could you deconstruct uh, for us uh, a bit of how communication works, and particularly communication as it relates uh, to fundraising within UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Because again, since you have so many different uh, units, mm -hmm. each school is communicating information about itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to remember, and I learned again, I was, did my graduate work at Berkeley. Uh, this was the uh, birthplace of the free speech movement. Right. <laughs> so when it comes to s communication, free speech, um, it is a high value yes. of the place, and therefore, <laughs> uh, it is real hard to, uh, yeah, that said, real hard to put any editorial controls right. on any of the units communicating out. Where it really gets much more tricky for us is to the extent that they're linking their communications directly to fundraising. And then what I find, and I have reported back to the campus many a time, uh, an alum, a donor, a very loyal uh, and generous donor out in New York, Los Angeles, who says, I get something they think every day from the campus asking for money. And they're sitting there saying to themselves, what am I supposed to do? Which is the priority? What do I give to? 
Um, that's a tough conversation for me to have, especially coming out of a uh, much smaller but also much more centralized operation like Wellesley College was. I don't mean this is a, in, in a pejorative way at all, um, just as a descriptor. Is, is it somewhat anarchic, just <laughs> different organizations uh, within uh, UC Berkeley, different schools? Just mm -hmm. Well, let me say this, uh, we skirt on the edge of that. Uh, there really is not a master plan, if the opposite of that would be a, a plan that really encompasses all of the units on the communications front, doesn't exist. But you, use, you also use standards when it comes to format and brand and so on and mm -hmm. so forth yes. to try and create at least a consistency. That's right, and for the campaign, we're able to do it, but again, that's a very narrow slice of the communications, so there are magazines, journals that are getting generated out of all of the major schools and colleges and even the smaller ones, all of, all of whom are, are motivated in exactly the right way, keep, in, you know, keep our constituencies informed. The issue that we're starting to watch for more now, and it's going to be for all of our futures, is how to deal with the electronic media. Mm -hmm. Because there's a sense, first of all, all the people who are producing on the production end it's the cheapest form of right. communication. And it's also the riskiest, in my view, uh, because as soon as somebody starts putting berkeley.edu on their spam filter, we're all finished. There is a real complexity uh, to raising funds on the web, and it is not necessarily a straight shot, and mm -hmm. neither is it, is it guaranteed. Yeah, right, are, so are, I see are, that an issue on the horizon, bigger and bigger issue. How are you dealing with the the journey toward competence in this area. Are you bringing people in to advise you? Are you, are you, um, are you trying different approaches mm -hmm. out, testing them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are doing a lot more testing. We're doing a lot more um, tagging of our solicitations in terms of type. So whether it went by mail, uh -huh. whether it's a call, is a gift coming in through the call center by a phone conversation with our student callers, or mail, or an electronic solicitation, and so on and so on. And we now can tag these things very carefully. As you know, anything you're doing on the web, you can you tag. You've got right. these ways of tracking it with great specificity. So all of that's happening. At the same time, one of the, again, one of the uh, real advantages we have at Berkeley is we're in the heart of the innovative part of all of those technologies. We have people who are Berkeley alums, who are loyal Berkeley alums, who are more than happy to come in and advise us at various times. This is not people on our payroll, but they're volunteers, real experts who will come in. Uh, uh, interestingly, of course, the younger they are, the better uh, advice we're getting from them, uh, especially around the social networks. Yes. And just what you can do, what you can't, should do, shouldn't do. Uh, so it's a place where volunteers, again, and with the right expertise, can be uh, enormously helpful and save you a lot of money, frankly. Um, so it's a, it's a nice area for us, again, because of our location and the alumni connections that are there in Silicon Valley and so on. How do you look at it from the donor perspective? How do you organize yourself in that way? Right, way? right. So um, this is a place where I think the scale of the place is a benefit for us. That is, uh, because there are so many uh, units in the campus who have kept communities uh, uh, connections with their alumni and friends of whatever the area is, uh, and they do that instinctively, some of them do it very well, some of them not so well, but they all know the value of doing that. And therefore, we can depend on the engineering school uh, keeping that community uh, in, in connection and engagement with the campus. The place where uh, we've been challenged because of the recent cutbacks in our budgets uh, has been, and this is true for the whole campus, has been the ability to uh, connect the further away from the campus you go. So you mentioned international relations as an area that reports into me. Berkeley has historically had and continues to have very strong connections with Asia. Well, these are, that's a very expensive part of the world to be doing fundraising for us to be sending folks over. Right. But we do it, and you need to do it. And right now we're building a, a health science building with the lead gift from Li Ka-shing in, 
in Hong Kong, uh, these uh, relationships again will, will repay the campus. But if you stay within the Bay Area, then there's a much more active engagement with those constituencies. And again, to address your question, at appropriate levels, mm -hmm. right, there is some, everybody would love to have a relationship with the chancellor. It's just not gonna happen when you have 420,000 alums. Right. Uh, and so uh, there are different levels of engagement that, that the units really uh, attend to. They can make that work. Now, I would be remiss, David, if I didn't uh, mention uh, and, and ask you about the impact of California's budgetary situation mm. on the on the UC uh, system. It must also have an, a, a significant impact on the focus on fundraising. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what you've experienced, mm -hmm. what you expect to experience over the next years? Because it's not going to get better, I, I don't think, right. anytime yeah. soon. So there's a shift here that I'm sort of starting to feel and sense. Uh, when the uh, real budget crisis hit us in California, what, almost two years ago, and the news was focusing on scarcity in every respect, right? So the, the, you got a picture of a state legislature that was trying to figure out with very limited, much more limited than anybody anticipated resources, where are they going to allocate their very small amount of discretionary money? And the university system is part of the discretionary funds. In that process, my sense, I couldn't give you the, the exact data for it, there were a lot of stories about does the university system spend the money well, who controls that money, maybe the legislature should have tighter control. I think there's been something pretty close to a sea change now in the public perception because after all the cuts and after all the criticism, what's turning around now, I believe, is the public's awareness that, you know what, we probably cut the system as much as, as, as much we as possibly, possibly can without doing potentially permanent damage. And that suddenly has shifted. It just feels you see more articles about this. Chancellor Bergino is out speaking as a national figure now on the importance of public education, importance of the access issues, the fact that UC Berkeley right now has more Pell Grant recipients. That's the federal standard for the most financially disadvantaged students. One could even say near poverty level students. More Pell Grant recipients on the Berkeley campus and the entire Ivy League combined. Now that message resonates with people. Now it's at risk. And right. suddenly you start to read articles, op-ed pieces that are instead of criticizing the profligate spending in the universities or carelessness, now shifted over to, boy, we have a, a resource that or a treasure that is now going to be in jeopardy. But now at least people can come together and start solving the problem rather than, than, uh, than point fingers. Yeah, and the further point relative to communications from the campus out, there's a real strong push now for what people are referring to as advocacy on the part of the university, UC system broadly and Berkeley in particular, in Sacramento. So we're now talking to people who are not only about giving uh, in terms of contributions, but influencing the legislatures, because as we know, all politics is local and they're gonna have to put, have some impact on each legislative uh, uh, body and, and the uh, representatives in those areas. And that's also becoming a kind of point of awareness on the part of our alumni body. So it becomes part of the body politic, the economic body, body politic of the United States and of California if we are mm -hmm. going to be um, a, a leader in the future, mm -hmm. uh, and it all starts with education, mm -hmm. then um, participating in the dissolution of treasured educational institutions is not the way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that requires sustained funding. If we don't get another hit from Sacramento, and, and the hit that we had last uh, budget season, so a year ago, was uh, really substantial, $150 million, right at the end of the fiscal year in order to plan for the next fiscal year, $150 million cut amounted to 18% uh, cuts pretty much across the board in the campus, including development. So you start to cut that and you lose those FTEs. And as I've tried to argue with our campus leadership, you lose the relationships 
right? It's one thing to say, okay, we're going to pare down. Corporations do this all the time. Why can't we? And the answer is, if, if the best fundraising is built on relationships and you no longer have the people making those personal relationships, now you're going to be in trouble, not just in the present, but in the future. Um, we have a chancellor who's very aware of that and will do whatever he can to kind of keep us uh, in the business, so to speak. Now, the, the second thing that he's done rather courageously, and you may have read about it in our local papers, is to have brought in uh, Bain and Company uh, to look at the business operations on the campus, uh, to look at where can we save money. And uh, that's an important piece of work that's going on. I think it's important for our constituency to know that because right. it says he's really going to pay. We're paying attention now to that. And then the third track that's really quite important is we have set up through the UC Berkeley Foundation an endowment investment company and now have hired a professional chief investment officer building an investment office for the first time, the first time. on the whole UC system. We're the first campus to do it and the first time it's right. happened at Berkeley. Before that, we had fabulous volunteers, but they were volunteers doing right. that work uh, with money managers. But more importantly, we know now there'll be a much more careful eye on the, on the endowment and how, mm -hmm. how, it, how it produces. Again, I think a really important story for us to get out to our donor population. This is just an amazing transformation that we're all living through. And I think that the work that you're doing in transforming the sensibilities there and in collaborating with your colleagues is so important. And I'd like to thank you for sharing the insights, for sharing your experiences for others who are also struggling with the same kind of issues. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, thank you David.